Hi and welcome to the Trial Alliance. Today we're lucky enough to have Jason Shortis or Shorto. He's going to be going through the hows and whys uh, he got into Ironman. Not only that, he's going to tell us a little bit about the life balance he's has with family. And also, most, most importantly, and for this time of year for us with our coaching, he's going to talk about the importance of strength training. So this will be our one of three part series. We hope you enjoy it and uh, look forward to getting your feedback. And here's Jason Shortis. Right, one of the good things about, for me, about being involved with Trial Alliance is every now and again I get to interview some really world-class athletes, all right? So today, you, we get to have a little bit of a chat with Jason Shortis, all right? So, I was having a quick look at your website, Jason, and I always thought that it was around 77 Ironmen, but it says 83 now, so... Yeah, it's only three, so... So come forward. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly I'm not very smart, obviously. We're already it's not really up here. Yeah. But that's it. I'm, I was. I'm not. I'm actually retired now. I'm not doing any problems every year. I know that. The last one was WA. last one was WA, yeah. yeah. It was pretty impressive when he got up and spoke in WA about um, his last one. Jason won Ironman Western Australia in 2006 in an Australian record time of 8.03. Nice. Um, and was it the fastest fight? Uh, oh, it's, no, it's, I think Mitch has got the fastest bike time. I've still got the fastest run there. So, uh, yeah. two, 241. Okay, so, I'll ask a rude question first. How old? Um, I'm really old. I'm 45. I'm oh, 57. Yeah, so we'll yeah. 45. Right. When did you start Ironman? Uh, I did my first Ironman at 21 years of age, um, which is not recommended for anyone wanting to be studying an Ironman at 21. There's lots of other stuff you can do before you do go into that sort of crazy stuff. But yeah. So I guess that begs the question, why? Um, I, I kind of got conned into it. Like everyone else, you kind of get conned into it by a mate of yours. And I, I was training with a really, really good triathlete back at the time, a guy called Bruce Thomas, who had went seventh at Hawaii in 93. Bruce is a really good athlete. Unfortunately, now an athlete that's also got a pacemaker in, a defibrillator in his chest. So I had a, a disease, I suppose, a disease act called ventricular tachycardia. Basically similar to Greg Welsh, similar to Ian McCartney, similar to, I can rattle off a few names um, of athletes that have that now. Um, so Bruce's career ended way too short, but he was very professional, very good guy, and he basically said, mate, you're doing a lot of training, you might as well do an Ironman. I went, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that shit. Yeah. And I did it, and it was um, a life-changing experience. So 21, and then you just started the journey of your age, yeah, kind of. I, I, I qualified for Hawaii in my first time in. I uh, went to Hawaii and won my age group in Hawaii. Um, and then came back and raced on Mount Australia and went seventh overall and they gave me money and started giving me stuff. So I went, oh, this is a pretty good gig. Um, and so I um, kind of became an accidental professional triathlete. Okay. And then, yeah, so that, that, was, that was honestly how it happened. It was a, a bit of an accident. It wasn't anything that I really wanted to do. It was just like, I had this challenge and it was, I was only going to ever do one and that was going to be it, but it just captured my imagination. It was just fantastic. So, professional triathlete, uh, what would be your best race? Um, ironically, the best race is actually not one that I won. It was actually Ironman Australia. It was one of the last ones at, I, at Foster. And um, it was the first Ironman that Chris McCormick won. I remember that. It was about 2003, I think it was. <coughs> And I hopped off the bike at Ironman Australia, 21 minutes down on, um, I was 20 minutes down on, on Chris, and I was 21 minutes down on a very good triathlete from Tasmania called Craig Walton. Um, and I remember because at Ironman Australia in those days, they had a 5k loop, and then they had a, a 16k loop. So made 21, you did it twice. And I remember running out of transition, and Waldo was running back the other way. So he was 21 minutes up. And I was pro probably tipped to be one of the favourites. And I remember the commentator going, yeah, there's Jason Shortis coming out off on the run. He's not going to have a good day today. Looks like his day's done. And I went, I actually went, fuck you, and <laughs> ran down the hill and just went. That, that was um, an eye-opener for me because I literally just went, you know what, I actually don't give a shit about how I go anymore. I'm going to run as hard as I can for as long as I can. If I blow up, I blow up. If I don't, I don't care. And... Uh, Poor old Waldo came up the hill and I said, I'm going to see you later as I ran past him. He was like, <laughs> which is kind of, you don't kind of get that sort of aggressive style of racing in Ironman very much, but some ones. And I saw him at 30k in the run and I ran 
another half an hour interim. Um, I ended up coming third. I was 90 seconds behind. I ended up only finishing 90 seconds behind Macca that day, and I was in third place. And it was just the most amazing experience because I literally removed any expectation from the whole experience. I just went, you know what? I don't give a shit how I'm going. I'm just going to go absolutely flat out. I'm going to enjoy the crowd. I'm going to milk it for all it's worth, and I'm just going to run as hard as I can for as long as I can. And the crowd experience at an Ironman, if you've ever had the opportunity, is just amazing. It's absolutely fantastic. The energy. And at Foster, you used to have this really long straight that used to go down there, and you used to run both ways through it. And it was literally like this tunnel of energy. And I remember running through, and it was this people screaming at you as you ran down. Because I was starting to make up fairly big time. I ran a 244 or 245 that day. And they just they were just screaming at me running down this. And it was just like, holy shit, I can't stop. If I stop, everybody's going to be disappointed. I can't disappoint anybody. I'm just going to keep going. And I remember coming down the hill, and just well, my coach at the time was very, um, he was supposed to actually pull me off the course because I was sick. And he kept hiding behind a tree every time I came past, so I'd look for him. <laughs> and he was nowhere to be, so I just kept going. And um, I, I remember him actually getting really emotional and really like, and he's the most unemotional bloke I've ever met in my life. And it was like, wow. So that was the best race I've ever had. Okay, so we talk about an emotional thing. What was it like racing Busso last year? Oh, Busso is really special because um, it, it was, it was sad in one respect for, uh, because I didn't have the race that I wanted to because I was actually in good nick, you know, been in really good shape and trained really well for it and I had gastro basically and so I was just I wasn't able to deliver the performance that I felt the race deserved um, but it's just it's a cool it's a neat experience and, and people are very forgiving they were very forgiving of the fact that I wasn't racing so having said that there was a lot of adulation out there I know oh, I was yeah. running around yeah. and as you went past it was just well, it, it's, it's kind of like I've raced there six or seven times I think the worst race I've had there has been fourth or fifth you know I've won up twice I kind of raced that as their first race, so they didn't know what an Ironman was, and I turned up into town, and we raced the Ironman, and you know, immediately all these little kids are like, oh, you know, and they know who you are, and so, and I used to always go to the volunteers' dinner, I used to turn up and help run the local club races and all that sort of stuff, so it was, a, it's a bit of a home away from home, so it was really nice, it was a very, it's, it was probably the right place to finish, yeah. So. Things don't always go right for a tri for any athlete, yeah. right? and I know that in Basso there's been a couple of times. Did you miss the start one year, or was? Oh, I don't miss the start. Actually, that year in '93 when I came back and raced Australia, I was actually when the gun went off, I was in the portal. Yeah, <laughs> and the year I got seventh. So I thought my day was done, so I was literally in the portal when the gun went. And was there one where you swam off course? Yeah, yeah, there's been a bit of that too. Oh, I've actually not. My eyesight's probably not the greatest out of anyone. Um, I've actually got cataracts and I've got an operation coming up in a couple of months, so I can't see very well. My seeing eye dog's not real good either. So, but um, don't swim all that fast. Yeah, yeah. You don't swim real quick. But um, so I, well, I'm just crap. I'm just really bad in the water usually. So um, usually you just follow somebody else. So. Okay, so you're on the portal. You still finished seventh, right? You thought yep. your day was done, yep. right? You've come out of transition at Foster and they've said your day's over and you've gone fuck you. Right? So. Uh, how do you cope with adversity? So when something goes wrong, right, it's not always the end of the world, is it? No, no. I mean, it, it, yeah. Look, essentially, you got to. The beauty of, of Ironman triathlon is that it's made up of so many different parts. Um, what triathlon is, right? And I always liked it because I like a challenge, and it's a bit like this jigsaw puzzle, and you kind of throw it together, and you might get a good result at the end of it if, if you go through your processes. So essentially, that's what your coaches are there for. They they basically set out the processes that you need to look at so that you can go step by step. And don't look too far ahead and don't look behind at all. So essentially, it's about, if it all goes to shit, you just stick to your processes. It's the same in anything in life. You know, there, you, we've got lots of smart people in here from different aspects and different walks of life. So in, in your job, in whatever you, else you do, whether it's running four kids, if you're a mother of four kids, oh, I mean, the processes you've got to go through for that are mind-blowing, right? That's, that's a, an exercise in logistics right there. So to actually manage it, and, and it's an exercise in management, basically. You've got all these processes, and you focus on the processes, and just keep going. Um, I've always had a never give up attitude, and I think that's the one thing that's stood me in good stead for what I, when I was a triathlete, but also in other aspects of life as well. So we'll talk about that. Kids. Yeah, yeah, kids. I've got three kids. Um, I'm a part-time dad because I've been divorced twice. Awesome, I'm a catch, what can I say? Um, so I don't get to keep them all the time, but that's life. 
that's kind of what happens in this sort of space. Um, my eldest is 17, a 17 year old girl, um, and she's got probably, her mum, we used to race as a professional triathlete as well, that's how I met her, and she's the least athletic person I've ever met in my life, my daughter, but she's beautiful and she's awesome, and she does drama and art and stuff like that. And she wants to be a tattoo artist and fierce when she grows up. I'm so proud. Of her. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we've kind of talked, we're working through this at the moment. Um, I've also got a 12 year old girl who's beautiful. She's, she's a really cool kid. Unfortunately, very unco. But she's into dance and she's a really smart kid and she tries so hard. And then I've got a 10 year old boy. And Josh is probably the most talented one of the lot. And he's the laziest little shit around. <laughs> but they're great, they're really good kids. <laughs> no, he's, he's a good Everyone boy. He's, 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 own he's one of those kids who's actually quite smart and but just sort of cruises. He's a bit of a cruiser, old Joshy. And he'll work out his way, he'll work out with him. Okay, so not to be pry or be sensitive, but getting the balance right between family life and yeah. being a professional triathlete yeah. obviously is quite difficult. Yeah. So, um, I guess I'm after from a question perspective. How do you how do you try to how do you balance it? Oh, look, it's about priority, prioritising the things you've got going in your life. Essentially, I always look at it like you've got lots of balls in the air, and you've got to make sure the really important ones stay up, and occasionally you can drop the other ones. So it's about um, looking at what you've got on your plate and making sure that you prioritise your your energy in the right aspect. Um, look, family was always really important to me. Oh, I've my kids are always really important to me, I always have been. So spending time with them and, you know, when the two youngest ones were little, I used to do an hour and a half of my long run with the kids in the pram and then drop them off and then when their mum woke up and then I'd go and run the next hour or next half hour, 40 minutes and then and then. But it, so they always knew that I did triathlons and I'd ride the bike and they'd sit on the back and I'd take them to school and, you know, being involved in their lives was always something that's been important to me. And it, so it's a matter of prioritising. So, looking at what you've got, again, resource management, you know, it's what resources, what time you've got available and then making all the ones count. So it's about making the time that you do have available count. Uh, let me think of a couple of other things there. All right, so um, life as a professional triathlete, over. Right. Yeah. So what does the future hold for Jason Schwartz? Um, well, I suppose in my other, other part of my world, I, I, did a, I studied ex, uh, physiotherapy. Uh, then I had a career racing. Um, in the meantime, I studied exercise science as well. Um, did a master's in exercise physiology, so I'm an AEP or exercise physiologist. Um, so working in musculoskeletal rehab, that sort of exercise rehab sort of stuff. Um, but currently at the moment, I'm actually working orthopedics. So I have a little, I do a little bit of exercise rehab sort of strength and conditioning coaching on the side, um, and I work in um, in spinal surgery with spinal surgeons basically at the moment. Oh, really? Yeah, so um, it's it's mainly uh, technical support. So I literally go in with these guys and you kind of look at well, they, they talk about what they're going to do with the operation. You look at the read the X-rays and that sort of stuff. And there's there's obviously an aspect of selling with it as well because I work for a particular company that manufactures what they what they want. Um, and you got to be in theatre and you're on call. And like yesterday, I was in Tassie, which is, was was cold. I sat around on my ass for a lot of the time. But you know, it's just. It's interesting, it's a really interesting space. How long I work in that, I don't know. It's just, um, we'll see. But it was a, gave me an opportunity to get into a space that I hadn't really been in before and kind of put me outside my comfort zone a bit, so. But I'm enjoying the, I'm actually enjoying the exercise fizz and the, the, the strength and conditioning stuff as well. I quite, I really like that, dealing one-on-one -on -one with people and making, making differences, I suppose. So that gets, leads me back to triathlon, yeah. right? So how yeah. important is the strength and conditioning side of things? Um, for, for me, it was vital. Um, I, I had a, I was actually pretty good, I had a long career and I was relatively injury free throughout it. The only major injury I had was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. In 2000 I had a bike crash, because I always bike raced as well. So before I did triathlon I was a cyclist. Um, and I always used to bike race for a bit of um, drinking money. Um, I used to lead out sprinters basically, because I can't sprint, but I used to get them in front. And I actually snapped a chain um, sprinting, snapped a chain and the chain rings actually cut my right Achilles. On the bike, um, yeah. So it was a bit of a just a, like a one of those things that was like really like um, it could have been something that was career ending, ending, I suppose. But I, I took it as an opportunity. That was the first time I ever I couldn't run. And as a kid growing up, I loved running. All right, that was that was my little haven. I could get out and 
I have two young brothers. We're all really close in age. Mum had three boys under three. Yeah, your mum. And um, we used to beat the shit out of each other. So it was my way of getting away from them and actually getting out and having my own headspace. Um, and for once in my life, I couldn't run. And it was like, holy shit, what, what am I going to do? Like, if I can't run again, I'm going to, part of me is kind of missing. So I made myself as strong as I possibly could and researched it as much as I could so that I would always be basically physically capable of doing it and I wouldn't minimise it. So I, if, if you think that triathlon is, a, is about speed and it's about endurance, you're actually not right. Triathlon is actually purely a strength sport. It's actually strength. The stronger you are functionally, the better you go in triathlon. Right. So strength is actually a, a massive, massive thing, and that was the only thing I had going for me as a triathlete. I wasn't really good at, I couldn't, wasn't technically a very good swimmer. Technically, I'm an okay runner. I'm not fantastic. I can ride a bike because I can chew down the stem as hard as anyone, and I can throw up and keep riding. But other than that, I'm just not very smart. So, but I was strong, right? And that was what made me, allowed me to do 83 Ironmans and, and back up and again and turn up the next day. So from that aspect, it, I mean, strength allows you to produce power, which is what you need. So power and propulsion going forwards, but more crucially, it allows you to hold your body nice and stably. So you use less energy. You're very efficient in the way once you move, again, using less energy, and you're also less likely to break down as well. So the stronger you are, the less likely you're actually able to break down and lose time through injury, illness, all that sort of stuff. So it's actually a massive part. And that's probably my little little baby at the moment is, is trying to get endurance athletes which are all about just either running or just riding or just swimming, to actually look outside the box a bit and think about their extra training that you can do on the side that'll make a massive difference to your training um, as far as your, your triathlon or your swim bike run as well. So there's a few little things you can do and it doesn't take a lot of time. It takes a little bit of commitment, but it can make a huge difference to, the, to your experience uh, when you're training when you race. Okay. Yeah. I believe you've got a presentation yeah, for us. A little bit of a presentation for you. So, for me, thank you very yeah, much. Right. Pleasure. Fantastic. Thanks, right. So, Jason Shorts is a legend of Australian triathlon, let me tell you, and we are extremely lucky to have you. It's a bit of an overused term, I think. No, no, no.